some words today from Jesus, from John chapter 15, 1 through 11. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Lord is my rock and my deliverer. He is the shield, the horn of my salvation. Singing, I love you. 
Welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. Welcome to those who are online. Um, thank you for all for being here today. Um, obviously, you know that Pastor Lou has, has been traveling, so we have Deacon Bob here today to bring the word. Thank you for that. So. It should be great. Uh, I just want to make a couple announcements. Um, the stuff that's coming up in the life of the church to this week. Uh, obviously, Tuesday, there is going to be prayer time. There is no youth group tonight. Uh, Thursday, there will be Bible study like normal. Uh, prayer time on Tuesday is 7 o'clock. Or sorry, prayer time on Tuesday is 9 o'clock, and, and uh, Bible study on Thursday is 7 o'clock. Um, enter in. That, that is the best way to just press into the, words, the Lord's Word. Yeah. Um, we remember those that are uh, sick this, this week, uh, especially Brother Brian. Um, I know he's been going through some stuff, and Re Lo Sister Lorraine, who hasn't been here for a while. Also, April's mom, Joy. Remember her in prayer as we talk, as we, as we pray here, Lord. Uh, I do want to say one prayer before we give it over to Deacon Bob. Father God, we pray today. We pray for a safe return of the Divisias. We pray that 
all those that are sick and injured or hurting in this congregation, Lord, you give them that special touch that only you can give, Lord. Father God, we know that you are there, Lord. We know that you're going to be in the word here today. Let us let our minds be open for it. Let us receive it. Let us, uh, you know, just press into the vine as you always call us to do, Lord. Father God, uh, be with Deacon Bob as he brings the word here today. We know you've elevated him up like that, Lord, but... Um, and we just we just we just rejoice in that, Lord. Uh, and uh, as everything else, let it be done in your son's uh, Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. If I could have the kids of Sunday school come on up. everybody. Lord, we thank you so much for your word and for Jesus, and we thank you for these children who've come to hear it and to learn it. Pray that you will help them to uh, understand it, memorize it, and make it part of the rest of their, the deepest foundation of the rest of their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If I could call Ken, yes. If I call Ken and the singers back up for our second hymn. Ken was good.
Good morning. Praise the Lord that within this tiny little congregation, when Pastor Lou, who is very integral to our service here, we're able to worship. Brother Phil's able to lead worship, and Brother Ken's able to lead hymns, and he's gifted us within this small church with people who are able to be used by his grace for his glory. Hallelujah. Let's open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into the text that we're going to be reading. All right? Our Father in heaven, Lord, we come into your holy presence, Lord God, astonished and amazed by your saving and sanctifying grace. You told us, Lord God, that you would not leave us orphans, but that you would send the Helper, the Holy Spirit, to fill us, to lead us into all truth. And you said your word is truth. We pray, Lord God, that through this service and through your word, that you would fill us with the knowledge of that truth and your empowering grace to live out our Christian life for your glory. That we would each be pressing into the vine, being filled with the power of your spirit, transformed in our minds, in our hearts, and in our daily living, Lord God. We thank you that when we fail you, Lord God, which happens often in this flesh, Lord, that your mercy and grace is there abundantly to forgive us, to cleanse us, to pick us up, to teach us, and to cause us to move forward toward holiness and toward your glory. We pray that your word would enter into our hearts, Lord. I pray first and foremost that you would teach me to apply these things to my life, Lord God, that I would be diligent to add to my faith the characteristics of the divine nature that you have given us in Christ, Lord. I pray that each one of my brothers and sisters here would be diligent to hear your word and to apply your word to their lives, Lord, by being filled with the full knowledge of Christ, Lord. I thank you, Lord God, for whatever way you, you, you choose to use me this day, I pray that you would set me aside and that you would be heard from, that you would be glorified, and that your people would be edified. Thank you for this time now. Lord, we pray this to you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. So, I'm going to read a quote to you. And after I read the quote, I'm going to go to the text that we're going to be in, which is uh, 2 Peter verse 1 through 15, if you want to turn there now. And I'm going to read this quote again later in the uh, message. All right. So this is a quote from A.W. Tozer. It was, the book is The Crucified Life. It was written in 1957. It says, the, the scripture reference for this chapter is, Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man has been crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, but be slaves to righteousness. He says, the church is not some impersonal abstract floating around in space. Rather, the church is comprised of individuals who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The health of the church, then, is in direct proportion to the health of each individual Christian. That's us. If the church is to grow and be healthy, the individual Christians comprising the church must grow spiritually. Only a dynamically healthy church can ever hope to fulfill the commission of Christ to go into all the world and preach the gospel. One important thing needs to be understood. Not all Christians are alike, Jesus said in Matthew 13, 23. But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth, and also bears fruit, bringing forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Yet, too many of us are satisfied to be thirtyfold Christians. But the desire of our Lord is that we press on to become 100-fold Christians. The question then is, how do we go on to this stage? This is the focus of this book. And 
the focus of my sermon. I think it is my duty to prod the 30-fold and the 60-fold Christian to press on to the ultimate Christian experience, being a hundred-fold Christian. The path that accomplishes this is living the crucified life. I do not think it would be amiss to say that most Christian literature today is focused on the 30-fold Christians. Some might venture out to address the 60-fold Christians, but it is safe to say there are few who focus on 100-fold Christians. This book is dedicated to that very thing, and he called it the crucified life. Let's see what the Word of God says about all that. So in 2 Peter verses 1 through 15, Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us, by his glory and virtue, by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Whoop, hold on a second. Lost my microphone. That's right. Exercise brotherly kindness now. There we go. Love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know them and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a remember, remember these things after my departure. So, the closing verses there contextualize for us why Peter's reminding them of all these things. And if you've ever read 2 Peter, you know that he jumps off from this admonishment to live out the mature Christian life to combating false teaching, false teachers, to encourage believers as they wait for Christ's return, right? So, contextually speaking, Peter is writing to them and encouraging them to mature in their Christian faith so that they wouldn't be susceptible to false teachers. By filling our mind with knowledge, right? He says in this book here, knowledge, 13 times. 13 times Peter uses the word knowledge. And over and over again, he's calling to remembrance that we need to know God's word. That's what this whole passage is about. So let's break it down some. So he starts off right in verse 1 saying, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. He identifies himself as the author, Simon Peter. What's interesting here, apostle is a position of authority, right? 
He has, Peter has, by God, this authority that has been given to him because he walked with Christ. He fellowshiped with Christ. He lived with Christ. Yet, apostle follows what? Bondservant. Slave. Before any one of us can be anything before God and useful in his kingdom, we need to understand that we are first and foremost the slaves of Christ. So, what does that mean? Romans 6, 16 through 18 says, we were, I'm paraphrasing some, we were slaves to whom we obeyed once, which was sin. We were enslaved to sin. We were purchased by sin. Sin was our owner. Sin was our master. In order to be freed from that sin, if you have any understanding of how slavery worked, you have to be purchased from it, right? We needed a new master to come and purchase us from that enslavement. And that's exactly what Christ did on the cross. He purchased us. He laid down his perfectly righteous life in place of ours, took upon himself our sin, and suffered in our place so that he could purchase us by his precious blood. Now we belong to him. We, Christ owns us as his slaves and we own him as our master. That should be visible in our lives. And as we go through the rest of this text, we're going to see that the mature, the maturing Christian is the one that's empowered by the knowledge of God's word and by his grace and so can live out the application of this slavery we have in Christ. So he identifies himself as Christ's slave and Christ's apostle. That means everything that follows, calling himself an apostle, a position of authority, everything that follows now is to be taken as the authority of the apostle, with the authority of the apostle. These are God's words. God is speaking through Peter as he writes these things down, and he's speaking to us. Now, in a general sense, we're all apostles, because the word refers to ministers, and we're all ministers of Christ. We're ministers of the reconciliation. We go out from this church building every Sunday, and our desire ought to be to minister that reconciliation, to encounter people and to insert Christ. And in so doing, we're being his ministers and we're participating in the slavery, in the ownership that Christ has in our life. But that can only be done, as we read through here, in the power of his grace and in the fullness of his word. We slip and we fall from studying God's word and from breaking it down and chewing on it. In the first book Peter wrote, in the first letter, he said, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. It is God's word that causes us to be increasing in faith and in the power of his grace. So let's go on here to... Hold on a second. So Peter... Paul, the apostles, the apostles, none of us have apostolic authority in our lives, refer to themselves as Christ's slaves. We have to get that right in our lives. We belong to Christ and not this world. Our influence comes from Christ and not this society, not this culture. Praise the Lord. So, the second half of this verse, Peter identifies the recipients of the letter. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Contextually, the recipients of this letter, as seen in uh, chapter 2, are the recipients of the first letter, which were the pilgrims of the dispersia. And I'll just turn over there and read it to you. In Pontus, in Galatia, in Cappadocia, in Asia, and Bithynia. So 
the immediate recipients of his letters would have been a mix of believers. There would have been believing Jews, and there would have been believing Gentiles. But what he points out here is that we all share the same faith. That's what Peter means when he says, like precious faith. The faith that the apostles had is the very faith that we have. Hallelujah. The same power that filled them to go out into all the land preaching the gospel, not worrying about the consequences or the repercussions of trying to reach people with God's truth is the same power that fills us. The same faith. And where does that faith come from? He tells us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you say you have faith and it's not in Jesus Christ, then you're outside of this. The only acceptable faith before God is the faith that is in Jesus Christ because he imputes to us, he accredits us with this righteousness of our God and Savior. And stop, think about that for a second. Ever wonder about Christ's deity and equal as he is the co-equal with the Father? Let's read that. God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He is equal with the Father. And he died for us so that by faith he can accredit us with his own righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he... God the Father made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, perfectly righteous life. The Bible also says that the soul that sins, it shall surely die. Jesus, never sinned, ought to have continued living. But he laid down his life for us. Why? For he who made him, who knew no sin, to become sin for us that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. That's what we have become in Christ. In eternity, but not only there. The righteousness of God is something we actually live out in this life by faith, by grace, by his word. Hallelujah. So, Let's talk about this word obtained real fast. Obtained. In the Greek, it actually means to receive by divine will. Ephesians says, for by grace we have been saved, and that of ourselves? No. And that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. There's no boasting outside of Christ. There's only boasting inside of Christ. And he has caused us to believe. We have obtained this righteousness because God has caused us to be recipients of it by his divine will. This implies that we are undeserving of faith. We, have, we are undeserving of the faith we have and that we have it as a gift by God's grace and not by wages. If we were to work to earn salvation, that would be wages. The only thing that the Bible specifies as wages is death. Death being the wages of our sin. That's what we have earned with our living. That's what we have learned with our that's what we have earned with our sinfulness. Not life, not salvation. No. We have earned death and hell for eternity. But thanks be to God that through faith in Christ, he actually accredits to us this perfect righteousness of his son. And so he accepts us into eternity, not because of anything we've done, but because he's allowed us to be recipients of this righteousness. From the apostles down, faith is contingent upon the righteousness of Christ and not our own. That is freeing, brothers and sisters. We live out this life and we try to live out this righteousness, but we fail. 
But hallelujah, that Christ's righteousness is perfect and unfailing and eternal and everlasting and can never be taken away from us. The faith we have, the Father, Jesus said, nobody can snatch us out of his hand or his Father's hand. Nobody. We belong to him. Now, as we go through the rest of this passage, we're going to see that the application of that assurance is incumbent upon us walking and faithfully fueling our walk with grace. Because what is the result of grace? Peace. The result of grace is always peace, as we see in this next verse. Let's go on to verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. This is not salvif salvific grace. This is not grace pertaining to salvation. This is grace pertaining to sanctification, to living. And for the Christian, there is an abundance of it in store for us so that it can be multiplied to us. But how? How can God's grace and peace be multiplied to us? Well, he tells us, in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. What does that mean? It means, Christians, that we need to be filling our minds with God's word, with sound doctrine. In order for our hearts to be transformed, God's word must first enter our intellect. This is how it works. Apart from the intellect, we can have no growth in Christ. He transforms us by the renewal of our minds. Now, what we're talking about here is not just some empty theological knowledge. The word for knowledge here in the Greek actually means intimate knowledge. It's a connective knowledge. That's why I had Deacon Steve read the passage from John. Because we are branches connected to the vine. And when we're participating in that connection by filling up in the knowledge of God's word, we're actually growing and God's grace is being multiplied in our lives so that we can relationally walk with peace. Just as this grace here is referring to... Hold on a second, I'm turning this fan on. <laughs> Starting to sweat. Even so... This, just as this grace here is not talking about grace pertaining to salvation, neither is this peace. This is a relational peace we get from God when we walk in his grace. Brothers and sisters, you ever struggle with the assurance of your salvation? I'm sure you have. And that happens when we're not walking in his grace, when we're not empowered by his grace. Then that peace we forfeit. We forfeit that peace when we're not walking in his grace. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to the Lord, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That prayer and supplication and thanksgiving is walking in his grace. That's what Peter's talking about. That's how our grace, God's grace, is multiplied to us in the life of a believer. And what's the result? What does Paul say is the result of walking in that grace? Peace that passes all understanding. We don't need to wonder. We don't need to worry. We don't need to be anxious. And yet when we are... When we go to God with those cares, right, and submit them to him because his word says, cast our cares upon him because he cares for us, which is also a manifestation of his working and empowering grace in our lives, we receive peace. We receive assurance of our salvation daily as we walk with him. This is a relational peace, and I don't want any of us to miss this because we forego that relational peace when we're not practically walking in his grace. So, the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. That's his word. We're filled with the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord when we're in this book. 
when we're committed to it, when we're studying it, when it's transforming our minds and hearts and being seen in how we live. He goes on to say in verse 3 here, As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. This actually means God will manifest his own divine power in the life of the believer when they are filled with the knowledge of him. Again, there's that knowledge. When we're filled with the knowledge of his word and the empowering of his grace and the sanctifying grace, we can actually have God's power manifested in us. How so? Well, God spoke all things into, in, into creation. Is that what he means? Well, no. He's not talking about manifesting God's power in some mystical way. He's talking about manifesting God's power in what? Life and godliness. God's divine power causes us to live godly lives. Apart from his power, we can do nothing. That's what Jesus said in the passage Deacon Steve read, right? Apart from him, we can do nothing. But in him, we can do all things. We're sinners. We're redeemed sinners, though. We've been bought out of that sin. And now we're owned by Christ. As we grow in this divine power, it's not that we ever become sinless, but as we mature in Christ, there will be less sin. Just inadvertently through the power of his grace working in our lives. The conviction grows. The brokenness grows. The sinfulness decreases. At least it ought to be. He says, He has given us divine power to, that pertains to all things pertaining to life and godliness. All things. You're a husband. How you love your wife. All things. You're a wife. How you submit to your husband, all things. You're a worker. You have a job. How you relate to your coworkers, how you relate to your boss, all things. You're a parent. You're raising children. Th this power has been given to you so that you could walk in all of these things as God desires us to walk in them. He goes on to say, through the knowledge of him who called us, by glory and virtue. Whenever the New Testament brings up this word called, calling, it's the effectual call of God upon our hearts for salvation. So God has called us. God has spoken to us. God has taught us. And he's allowed us in humility of heart to learn from him. What did we learn from God the Father as he taught us? We learned that he was holy. We learned that he is righteous. We learned that he is just. We learned that we ourselves are not holy, that we ourselves are not righteous, that we ourselves are not just, and that we are in need of a Savior, which is why it says he called us by his glory and virtue. Whose glory and virtue? Christ's. When we present Christ the right way to a sinner when they contextualize their lives before a holy and just God, they see the glory and virtue of Jesus Christ as that which they could never attain, and so they're drawn to him. We're drawn to Christ because of his glory and his virtue, because of his perfection. And that doesn't change for us, brothers and sisters. We read about Christ in his word and we see God's perfection and God's holiness and we see that as that which we could never attain on our own and so we press into the book. I dropped my 
a battery. That's all it was. All right. So he says, by which, by which, verse 4, have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. All of the promises that we have in Christ stem from Christ. They come from Christ. From Christ's glory and virtue. That's why in, hold on a second, I wrote down the verse. Well, I don't see the verse, but I know the verse, not the verse number. That's why God's word says that in Christ, all of his promises are yes and amen. They stem from him. They're unchangeable. They're for us. And as this verse says, there's practical application of those promises in our life. It says, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. There's no greater promise in your life than that which Christ has already revealed to you. Hold on one second. That was 2 Corinthians verse 1 and 20. All right? Yes and amen. What promises then? Well, he's promised us salvation and everlasting life. He's promised us an inheritance in heaven, in Christ. He's promised us that we will resurrect one day and be given glorified bodies. He's promised us assurance of our salvation via the sealing of the Holy Spirit. He's promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. All of these promises have practical application in the life of a believer. Well, how so? Let's read on. That through these, through what? The promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature. You see, when we came to Christ, a divine transformation happened. He took our hearts of stone and he gave us hearts of flesh. He gave us a God conscience. He gave us the ability in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to see sin as sin. To see his righteousness as righteousness. To see his word as his word. And through the promises, we partake in that, div that divine nature. So these ought to be practically experienced in the life of the believer. The promises ought to enable us to participate in the divine nature. According to the new nature, right, 2 Corinthians 5.17 talks about how we're new creations in Christ. The old things have passed away. And as we go through this text, we're going to see that when we're blind and when we're short-sighted and we're not walking in His grace and we're not walking in the knowledge of His Word, we actually can fall into living that former life, which none of us wants to do. Because we know it grieves the heart of our Savior. It quenches the Holy Spirit in us. And so we participate in this new nature through these promises. Through having these promises ingrained in our minds and our hearts. God's word often equates God's promises with his word. Psalm 19 talks about how the judgments of the Lord are clean. In the same manner, we could think of these promises. And so, they should be desired more than gold. And they, and, and that by them, we are slaves of God. By those promises, we're warned. And in keeping those promises, we have great reward. That's what Psalm 19 says. Now, this divine nature, it has freed us from the corruption that is in the world through lust. 
That's what he says. That through these, through those promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Did you know that there's corruption in the world? Do you know that the corruption in the world exists because of lust? Hallelujah. Christ has delivered us from that corruption. He has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. The Father has taken us off of the broad road which leads to destruction and has placed us on the narrow road that leads to life. Hallelujah. It's interesting that Peter is talking about corruption because later on in chapter 2, as he talks about the false teachers, he talks about how they're corrupt and how through their, 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 their teachings are attempting to influence the Christians of Peter's day via sensual lusts. And yet, they're slaves to that corruption. It's evident in how those false teachers live that they're slaves to that corruption. And yet, they know that in our flesh, if we're not filled with God's word and the grace and empowering, sanctifying grace of God's word, we're susceptible to those sensual lusts. That's why we need to be in the book. That's why we need to know sound doctrine. So that when trials and tribulations come into our lives, a false teacher can't come along and sink his teeth into us. So he says in verse 5, but also, For this very reason, for what very reason? The very reason that God has given us in Christ a new nature. For the very reason that God has caused us to escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. We ought to give all diligence to something. To what? To adding to our faith. Now, let's stop there for a second. Because if you don't own this faith, If this faith is not yours, it does no good to try and add these lists of divine characteristics to your life. Because in adding these things to your life without faith in Christ, you're attempting to earn something before God. And we could never earn anything before God because even our best works are filthy rags before him. Even our best works are dung. Me preaching up here has nothing to do with me. It's an it's enablement of God's grace. It's all his goodness working through me. I'm nothing but dust that he chooses to use. Praise God. So I encourage you all to examine your own hearts. To make sure that your faith is not in yourself in your piety, in your religiosity, in your study of God's word, in your, in your witnessing, in your worshiping, in anything but Christ. Salvation is only in Christ and Him crucified. So, if we have that understood, then we can go on. So, this is what I like to call the function of faith. If I were to give this sermon a title, which I suppose I have to as they upload it later, I would call it the function of faith. Faith ought to function. Did you know that? Faith ought to be seen in our lives. How so? By adding to it. Now, how do we add to it? Only when we're filled with the working, enabling, empowering grace of God's word. That's why, it, that's why it's important to understand that this word knowledge that keeps getting repeated is not some head knowledge. It's knowledge that is desired from a heart that loves God. This knowledge is only 
accessible to those who have been given a new nature. And so we now, filled with God's grace, filled with the knowledge of his word, connected to the vine, we add to our faith. We add to our faith. God works it out in us, but we walk in it. That's why it's, the un- it's important to understand how God works through his word. He works it in our minds. He transforms it in our hearts. And then we cognitively decide to be obedient to it. That's how God's grace works in our lives. He doesn't zap us and make us holy. He doesn't let us off the hook for the sin that remains in our life. Elsewhere in this book, Peter says, ready for this? Consider the patience of our Lord as salvation. Even now when I sin, I don't deserve to live. I deserve to die before God. But Christ died for me and so God can be patient with me. And Christ stands in heaven interceding on my own behalf. He belongs to me. He belongs to me. She belongs to me. They're ours. So now he calls us to add virtue to our lives. What is virtue? Virtue is moral excellence. But wait, you just said nobody could be moral excellent, only Christ. And yet when we press into Christ the vine, we're filled with the Spirit and this sanctifying grace, and we can actually pursue and live out moral excellence. Not for salvation, not for earning, not for reward, but because our hearts love God, our Savior, and want to, as, as one of the hymns, now I owe him everything. We owe him everything. And so we add to our faith virtue, moral excellence. Philippians, I'm going to turn over to Philippians, chapter 4. I'm just going to read it to you. Verse 8 goes through this list of the things that we should be thinking of. It says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good, of good rapport, if there is any virtue to them, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Moral excellence is a multifaceted thing. Moral excellence includes truth. Moral excellence includes righteousness. Moral excellence includes purity. Moral excellence includes grace. Moral excellence includes justice. Moral excellence includes anything and everything that God considers good. That's what we should be adding to our faith. Not what's on the news, not the newest social issue of the day, not what the culture considers right, but what God considers right. That's what we ought to be adding to our faith. Go back to Second Peter. So, to faith, we add moral excellence. And to moral excellence, we add knowledge. Again, this is not an intellectual knowledge. This is not the pursuit of knowledge to win arguments or debates or be able to wax eloquent on Facebook or social media. This is knowledge that is stemming from a heart that longs to be obedient to their God and Savior. This is knowledge that longs to love God. This is connective, functional knowledge. It is the connection between theory and application. It is driven by our relationship with Christ. Now, in the first century, a cult 
was born, and that's Gnosticism. These false teachers that Peter was writing to combat against were Gnostics. They had claimed that, oh, you don't need to go to that church where Peter's preaching, where the word of God is preached, because I have special, personal revelation from God. That's not this knowledge. The knowledge we're talking about is in this book. It's in his creation in as much as it correlates with his word. I don't know if many of you follow me on Facebook, but the past couple of days I've been like blown away by, I, I go upstairs to bed, and, and my dogs know I sleep upstairs. It's not like they, oh, where'd he go? They might, maybe they think I disappeared, I don't know. But I come down every morning and... Me being their master, their owner, they greet me with the same exuberance and excitement every day. And yet I can't wake up to get in this book sometimes. God, by his word and by his faith, rebuke me via my dogs. (laughs) And when we're filled with his empowering grace, That happens in the course of life. I remember Brother Hector over here once shared a word at Men's Fellowship. And he was doing a bit of gardening. And while he was gardening, he observed a vine growing up a tree. And how that vine could choke off the tree. And how that he made application of that to worldliness in our lives. When we're filled with God's grace and we're filled with the knowledge of his word, we experience him in daily living, even in his creation. We want to experience him by faith. That's what I want each one of us to get. This isn't some blind faith that we just believe. It's experienced. It's experiential in the life of the believer. God prompts us. He convicts us. He moves us. And when we're filled with his grace, we're obedient to those promptings, to those convictions, to that direction. When we're not, we fail. And we will give an account for that one day. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God the Father prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. How can we walk in them if we're not filled with the knowledge of God's word and his empowering grace? We can't. And one day when we stand before our Savior, we will give an account for those times we failed him. And when we do, we will suffer loss. And that loss will be I'm standing before the one who died for me. He has my book open in front of him and all of these works which he planned out beforehand for me to walk in, and I didn't. He died for me and I couldn't serve him. He died for me and I didn't glorify him. He died for me and I failed him. Why? Because I'm full of myself. Because I'm filled with this world and not his word. We have to press into this book, brothers and sisters. It's the only way we can be empowered to live the godly life. How about this next thing Peter talks about? Whoa, self-control? Does that imply I have to do something? Yes. Self-control is only used... Three times. This Greek word for self-control is only used three times in Scripture. And it means to have one's own passions under control. It is, in effect, mastery of self and self-restraint. The Greek literally means dominion within. If we can't control ourselves, how can we be of any benefit to anybody else? We can't. We got to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 for a second. Verse 24. Anybody was an athlete growing up? 
Anybody who participate to participate in athletics, you're going to get this. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate. That word temperate is self-control. Self-controlled in all things. Now they do it, the athletes, to obtain a perishable crown. But we, an imperishable crown in heaven, that's our reward in heaven. That's what God will give us when we reach his gates. And he says to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Did you know, brothers and sisters, that there's rewards in heaven? And that according to how much we reflect Christ's glory in this life is how much we will reflect Christ's glory in eternity. I want to reflect him to the maximum amount of his glory. Therefore, I run thus, Paul says, not with uncertainty. He has an aim. He has a goal in mind. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. You ever seen a shadow boxer? They train by going through their movements. They shadow box. They're not actually fighting anybody. They're beating the air. That's not what Paul's talking about here. But he disciplines his body. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. Self-discipline. Self-control is paramount in the life of a Christian because when we share the gospel with others and we're not walking in self-control and we're walking in hypocrisy, we actually disqualify ourselves and can disqualify the message we're sharing. Athletes, my brother's back there. He was a wonderful wrestler growing up. And I remember when I was younger watching him that for me to be a good wrestler, I would need to be self-controlled, right? You have to make weight. You can't eat McDonald's. What can you eat? Well, my dad only stocked the cupboards with rice cakes and nutri bars when it was wrestling season. So if we couldn't be self-controlled, our dad ensured that we would be self-controlled. <laughs> But in order to be a successful athlete, self-control is necessary. What Paul's trying to get us to understand is in order to be a, self, a, a, a successful Christian, self-control is necessary. By God's grace, we bring these bodies into subjection, lest when we witness to others, we ourselves are disqualified. Hallelujah. These false teachers in this book that Peter's writing against were full of self-indulgence and impulsiveness. Good reminder to point out false teachers. Look at their lives. Is there any self-control? Are they indulging in every passion of this life and of their flesh? If they are, run from them because they're not teaching you sound doctrine and you could tell by the way they are living. Back to Second Peter. So, from self-control, we move on to perseverance. You just don't have to turn there. You can if you want. I'm going to turn over to Matthew 24, verse 3. He says, so the disciples come to him in private and ask him, how can these things be and what sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus answers them and says, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars 
and rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. And, but all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended will be, and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Ready for it? But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Perseverance. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 4 says, So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Pastor Lou not too long ago went through, uh, what is it? I think it's Acts 17 or 19. It's Acts 17. Where we read about how the ministry was started in Thessalonica. Thessalonica. It was not pleasant. They were berated with persecution from the inception of their faith. And yet, Paul says here in his second letter, we ourselves, the Apostle Paul, boasts among all the churches of God of the patience and faithfulness of the Thessalonica, Thessalonian believers in that they endured persecution and tribulation. They persevered. We persevere. We get knocked down. We get back up. We fail. We get back up. We learn from our failures and persevere. Perseverance is manifest evidence of God working in our lives. Praise the Lord. He goes on from perseverance to godliness back in 2 Peter. Godliness. This, is, this, this word refers back to our new nature. When we were born in, again in Christ... God gave us a new heart that was capable of love for him, that was capable of a right piety before him and a correct reverence before him, a devotion to him. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3-6, through 6, Paul writes to Timothy describing this doctrine that accords with godliness, and teaches, which teaches us that how we live, matters. Any implication that how we live does not matter fights against the very words of Jesus who said things like, it's better to give than receive. If anyone ever tells you, hey, you're in Christ now, how you live doesn't matter, mark them as a false teacher because how we live does matter. How we live glorifies the God who saved us and adorns the gospel of our salvation. How we live most certainly matters, brothers and sisters. Let's go on. Brotherly kindness. Philadelphia. Phileo is the love. 1 John 4, 20 talks about how, well, you say you love God, but you hate your brother? You're in error. You don't love God. You're not saved. You're not a Christian if you say you love God and hate your brother. The manifestation of your love for God will be seen in the manifestation of your love for your brother. We ought to be affectionate towards one another.
Love. The desire, this is what love is, right? Love is to desire only good for others. To love them as God has loved us. God, later in this book, says through Peter that he doesn't wish that any should perish, but that all would come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. God hopes good for all of us. He hopes that those who don't know him would come to him. And he hopes that those of us who are his would come to him. He desires good for us. And we ought to desire good for one another. Even for those who are our enemies. Even of those who persecute us and hate us for our faith. We ought to desire good for them. And in doing so, we reflect God's own divine nature within us. I'm going to have to wrap this up here soon. I got four minutes and I'm nowhere near done with this passage. So thankfully, Pastor Lou reminded me I'll be preaching in September, so there'll be a part two. (laughs) Don't clap for me. I'm nothing. So the end caps of Christian maturity are what? How did he start this off? Add to your faith. And how did he end it? Love. Everything in between is incumbent upon our faith in Christ and his word and our love for Christ and his word. When we are walking in that faith and experiencing him by faith, by grace, we'll be walking in love and living out our Christian life in love. And so virtue and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness will all be ours. Hallelujah. Just a, for if these things are yours, and they ought to be. That's the indication there. These things ought to be evident in the life of every single Christian. Generally, but personally. If they are yours and abound, which is increasing, you will neither be barren or unfruitful, again, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not even going to get into that because it'll take way too long to flesh out. I want to leave that for next time. So what I want you to walk away with this is God's grace has saved us. God's grace keeps us. And God's grace sanctifies us. It empowers us. But not in any other means than his word. You want to be empowered by God's grace? Get in the book. And I know it seems like every Sunday when Pastor Lou's up here, it's the same thing. The conclusions. And they are. How do I know? Peter says, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. The Apostle Peter was reminding the believers he was writing to of something they already knew and was present in some of their lives. And so we come back again and again and again to the same truths. We need to be in God's Word and we need to be reading it and studying it humbly and asking Him, Lord, I believe, and where we come across something that's hard for us to believe, help my unbelief. That is not a prayer that the Lord hates because we see in the Gospels when the gentleman that said that to the Lord, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Jesus wasn't like, get out of here. I'm not healing your servant. He healed him in order to increase his belief. And so 
Get in God's word, stay in God's word, and walk in his grace and experience him by faith. Let's close in prayer, brothers and sisters. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We come to you the only way we come, empowered by his grace. You have set us apart in eternity by your grace, and you cause us to grow in this life by your grace. Help us to not be stagnant, but to be maturing in our faith in the full connective knowledge of Christ according to your word. Forgive us where we've fallen short. Help us to recognize that the promise of your mercies being new every day is for us in the intimate sense that we can restore a right relationship with you practically and so walk in assurance of our salvation and peace with you. Thank you, Lord God, for the time you've given us in your word. I pray that as we go forth this week that we would be Christians who participate in the life of of your grace and the divine power and nature you have given us in your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Uh, you want to? Let's sing the last hymn. If you guys want to come back up for that last hymn, it's. Hold on, I know. It's for my phone's down there. You remember which one it was, Fammy? Four sixty-eight. Four eighty-six. Four eighty-six. Faith is the victory.
at the end of a second. Go stop. Go stop. Deacon Chris is going to come back up. He's got a couple words, and then he'll dismiss us. Again, thank you guys all for coming today, Lord. Um, just want to remember uh, that we do take an offering in this church. It underwrites the, the stuff that we do here. To, uh, it underwrites this entire ministry. Uh, if you want to give, there's a box on the way out the door, as always. Uh, I just want to say one more prayer before we go. Lord, thank you for your grace that exceeds our understanding. Yes. Thank you that you've separated us from the world. Yes. Be with us in the understanding of your word and with those that are in need of healing. Be with grace as you heal here. Heal her. Be with Ryan and Raymond as you are working your word within them. Be with the youth of Upward as they meet on Friday. Yes. Share your word with them, Lord. Let it, let it grow within them. Yes. Be with all of us as we share your word this week, Lord, as we reach out to those that are in the world. Thank you, Lord, for separating us from said world with your grace, Lord. Yes. In, this, we may, in your son's mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Adios. Praise the Lord.